it, it's certainly not done enough. And, and, and when we're talking about reliability testing, you know, we're talking about the elevated heat and humidity testing on the actual product, not material screening, not not for yeah, not coupons, not ECM testing. Um, you know, I'm talking about your product, th this product that's going to keep me alive. I want to put it under heat and humidity, under you know, operating bias for 500 to a thousand hours or until failure. Uh, j just to make sure that what we have done in, in the uh, in the assembly process, you know, is effective at, at keeping that board working slash keeping me alive. That was Eric Camden. He and Paco Solis are failure analysis investigators and my guests coming up next. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to another edition of Reliability Matters. I'm Mike Conrad. Let's consider the definition of reliable. Webster's defines reliable as suitable or fit to be relied on, dependable. Another definition is giving the same result on successive trials, one might say, consistency. So dependability and consistency are what we expect in reliable products. As I stated in my last podcast, modern electronic assemblies can be found in nearly every aspect of our lives. They wake us up in the morning, they assist us with making breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they drive us to and from work, and they fly us to distant lands. Electronic assemblies protect our home when we're away, they warm and cool our environments, they entertain us, they diagnose us, they cure us, they protect us, and so much more. Now more than ever, reliability is vital to our quality of life. We trust the products we rely on to be dependable and to be there when we need them. In the light speed pace of electronic evolution, electronic assemblies have become highly miniaturized, densely populated, and more difficult to assemble. Bottom terminated components highlight concerns such as voiding, heat dissipation, flux entrapment, and cleaning challenges. The explosion of automotive electronics has thrust millions of assemblies into harsh environments, subjecting them to heat, cold, moisture, vibration, and so much more. The popularity of electric cars with batteries producing 375 volts or higher, operating in arguably harsh environments, presents unique reliability challenges. Implantable medical devices operate in harsh environments. The human body, even wearables, part of the IoT explosion, operate on our bodies or in our clothing and are frequently brought into harsh environments. And there's a direct link between harsh environments and reliability. In 1999, professor of sociology and chair of the Department of Sociology at Colby College, Neil Gross, said, In the next century, planet Earth will don an electronic skin. It will use the Internet as a scaffold to support and transmit its sensations. That was 20 years ago. Today, we live in a highly connected world. We are surrounded by connected devices. Electronic assemblies are being installed in products that, until now, were not formally associated with electronics. In 2015, there were 15 billion connected devices. Cisco predicts that number will rise to 75 billion by 2025. 2025, that's not long. There's a lot of circuit assemblies functioning in unfamiliar locations. New connected devices such as smart thermostats, smart electrical outlets, smart light bulbs, smart door locks, smart toothbrushes, smart utility meters, even smart cement. Yeah, cement with embedded nanosensors capable of transmitting and responding to mechanical, acoustic, and magnetic signals will challenge the electronic assembly industry. During the last episode, we spoke with SMT guru Bob Willis. His consulting business helps electronic manufacturers assemble their products correctly. So here's the way I see this. Either one knows how to assemble their products correctly, or one seeks out a qualified consultant and learns how to build their products correctly, or one hires my next guest to tell them what went wrong. Foresight, founded by Terry Munson and located in Kokomo, Indiana, specializes in analyzing and solving electronic assembly performance and reliability issues associated with residues, primarily resulting from electronic manufacturing processes. Two of their lead investigators are Eric Camden and Paco Solis. 
Eric has been with Foresight for 19 years and is responsible for cleaning processes and parameters, PCB and PCBA process optimization and troubleshooting, as well as performing on-site investigations. Eric has been a featured speaker at industry conferences and a few workshops that I've produced. He's an unconventional speaker and has a tendency to make the otherwise mundane subjects exciting. Paco Solis has been a technical consultant with Foresight for 15 years, and he's primarily responsible for materials analysis and root cause failure analysis investigations. Together, Eric and Paco are lead investigators, dissecting circuit assemblies like crime scene investigators. So welcome, Eric and Paco. Welcome to Reliability Matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eric, you're very welcome. Eric, congratulations on your current article. I know you have a monthly article on uh, SMT Magazine, uh, part of the 007 um, conglomerate of, of magazines and online um, uh, resources. Congratulations on that. I think it's about reliability. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions on that in a little bit. I want to give you guys, I want to give you a chance to talk about that. But first, let's talk about the company you work for. Tell me more about Foresight. What does it do? What kind of customers do you have? Uh, either Paco or Eric, uh, I'll jump run in with there. that, please. Yeah, basically, you know, what we uh, what we tell people when asked, you know, a blanket statement, what do we do? You know, we are an analytical test lab for the electronics industry. Now, that's a very broad brush that we paint with right there. But basically, you know, we're testing for anything that can impede reliability from the manufacturing of bare boards, components, all the way up to final packaging out the door. So, you know, we're testing with a whole suite of tools to determine, okay, is there anything in this process that will add to the risk for electrical leakage, electrochemical migration, or, or any type of failure in the field that's related to the process itself, um, all the way down to the basic parts. So um, we do that in a couple different ways. We can do that up front, which is usually a lot smarter uh, to determine how effective your process is before you go to release. Or we can always do it from the back end when you bring us a you know sm smoking, smoldering hulk of what used to be your product and say what happened, you know, and then we'll take it from there. And, and that's really you know where we get called the, the crime scene investigator type um, company because we uh, we have the history, we have the knowledge to take that and back look at it going all the way back and kind of determine, okay, what did happen here and what are the, uh, the environmental factors that may have played a part in this or was it all manufacturing? So um, really we like to think of ourselves as a reliability lab first because we want to help the customers uh, mitigate any possible issues. But uh, obviously a lot of what we do is failure analysis. And, uh, and we do that with a, a whole suite of tools, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, with ionic chromatography, cross-section, um, you know, we have a lot of the, the standard tools that uh, that are used in the laboratories. You know, obviously, we're not the only lab out there, but I, I like to think that uh, one thing that sets us apart from, from other labs is the history and the knowledge that we have of the, process, the uh, assembly process itself. And when we put that in conjunction with the results from each of those tests, it really gives us a better picture of, okay, what happened? I, I think we just coined a new in, uh, industry acronym, um, S H P smoking <laughs> hunk of product. I love that. Yep, smoking hunk of product. <laughs> there, there's a saying. There's a saying that I I love, and unfortunately, it's true uh, with a lot of people. And I I cited it in the last podcast with Bob Willis, and that is, you know, we don't have time to do it right, but don't worry, we have time to do it over. So I guess it starts with reliability, and if that doesn't work, it's, it it then starts with failure analysis, right? To coin another phrase, I mean, sometimes I tell my customers, uh, it's like, yeah, yeah it, it does cost to bring us in, but, you know, foresight is less expensive than hindsight. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. Hence that, that, uh, that statement. How much of your business takes place at the customer's facility versus your facility? Do you go to the problem or does the problem come to you or both? Yeah, go ahead. Well, Eric, do you want me to yeah, step in on this one a little bit? Well, it, it, it doesn't always start at the, the customer site, but uh, when we're introduced to a new failure mechanism that, uh, that may challenge us a little bit, we'll, we'll sometimes have to go to the customer site. And the nice part about having an industry with a laboratory like we have is it's great to have some of the product in the laboratory as we're traveling to the customer site. And we've even had some times to where the, the crew in the lab is working on the issue as we're in the air. And by the time we hit the ground, we already know where to start looking. So it may start at the customer site, but uh, once we're in with a customer and start gaining that trust and working the problem through, sometimes it ends up going to their subcontractors and their suppliers in order to get them root cause. So it doesn't always start or stay at their facility. 
Yeah, maybe the genesis is at the customer's factory or the board fabrication factory, but the the actual failure may take place, probably takes place in the field. I would imagine that's it, parts come back to the manufacturer not working, correct? At many times, yes. It's, it's that, uh, especially when it's the no trouble found, when they're having a bunch of problems in the field and they get it back to their lab and they're going, hey, I can't get it to fail. When I give presentations, I, I have this, we talk about... Uh, parasitic leakage and that it's a temporary problem, which is extremely frustrating to diagnose because typically in a lab environment, climate controlled, humidity controlled, the problem doesn't exhibit itself. And STP when it goes has into, its own rules. Uh, yes. So I always, uh, I always add another acronym to um, NTF, no trouble found. I, it's usually followed by WTF, which is uh, another yes. acronym <laughs> suitable for that type of frustrating application. Right? Absolutely. Uh, it just happens that way. <laughs> So what's the state of reliability with our, in electronics? The intro to this, in my intro to this webinar, I talked about IoT and, and the fact that there's going to be, by 2025, 75 billion connected devices, a lot of them in um, products that have never formally seen circuit assembly. So they're going to go into you know uncharted territory in terms of use, environment, things like that. Um, what do you see right now and what do you foresee in the near future uh, with regard to reliability in electronics. It's interesting that you brought that up and talking about the IOT um, and one of my recent articles for that, uh, for the iConnect 007, um, you know, talked about some of the same things you've mentioned earlier with how many, you know, many more millions of devices are coming online and how many more things are expected to work right out of the box, you know, with good reliability. Um, when, uh, when more and more product is becoming, popular like that with the IOT, um, more things are being built and they're being built faster. And, you know, faster is not always, uh, not always a good thing. You know, selling more products always good for the, um, for, for the supplier. But anytime you crank that belt speed up when you're going through an assembly, because all of a sudden now I need, you know, 2000 a day instead of 1000 a day, there isn't a whole lot of thought put into the effect on reliability. So, you know, it, in terms of what we're going to see, or what we are seeing now, and you know where that goes in the future, I think it's only going to exacerbate the problem because so many more things are becoming connected, and that, you know that's more assembly. That's a you know it, anytime you get a high volume call for things like that, um, and, and this is happening on more and more expensive products. So you know in general, you know we don't work around here. We don't work on a lot of the you know IPC class one type, the disposable consumer electronics, but now that uh, more high-end electronics are being built and sold for the uh, for the Internet of Things when we're talking about, um, you know, kitchen appliances, you know, of all things or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, these are more high-end um, things that are warranted for much longer. So, you know, the quality on these types of devices really has to be paid attention to. But the way that, you know, the boom in the electronics industry is going right now, the, there, I see a lot of people cranking out more product without taking the more time to look at how or how that impacts reliability. So, you know, really, I think, you know, we are seeing more reliability issues now than we have in the past. And a lot of that is just due to the fact that there's more product being sold. You know, I'm 58 years old and I, you know, I've kind of witnessed as anyone my age, uh, the the transition between mechanical devices and electronic or, you know, so-called solid state devices. And I remember when I was young, one of the advantages of buying something that's solid state is there's no moving parts. It will never fail. And, and that was kind of true. I have a I have a classic car. I have a 1968 Mustang, and it has the original Ford AM radio in it. And, you know, there's transistors in there and stuff like that. It's solid state. And it still works. And it's 50 years old this year. It's 50 years old. And, you know, but then back then, things were built quite differently. We used um, a rosin flux. We cleaned it. The components were proportionately speaking, miles apart from each other. Uh, there was no such thing as surface mount back then. There was no such thing as high density, or at least high density was a different uh, a different definition back then. So, uh, but there still is, even with class one, if I buy something that, if I buy a, um, I don't know, a DVD player or something, I expect it to last for 20 or 30 years. I don't expect... Uh, the electronics to fail. So even though class one is not required to last for 50 years, it's still expected to last for 50 years. And as people start embracing this IoT and we start 
bringing in electronic assemblies into our toothbrushes and whatever, um, there will be an expectation of reliability, whether or not there's a requirement for it. And I think that is um, paramount in building reliability, even in uh, devices that don't specifically require it. No one dies if a toothbrush fails. Maybe the person smelling your breath might feel they're going to die, but no one's going to die if a toothbrush fails. So, but, but there is that expectation. And a lot of class one electronics have such a low profit margin. I mean, it's a race to the bottom to, you know, how to build these things that they really can't afford for um, a one-year warranty to not last one year. Uh, so there has to be a certain amount of inherent reliability, even in consumer devices. Is, do you agree on that? Does that make sense to you? I, I absolutely agree with that. But I think the way I would differentiate that is with a class one device like your DVD player, um, you know, yes, there is a 90 day, 120 day, one year warranty, whatever it might be, but they're not going to fix that board. They're going to send you a new one. Right. So I, I think that's one of the differences I see between those two different things. Yeah. It's there's a new no board one. that was designed and made exactly the way the one that failed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So unless you flushed it down the toilet, it's going to suffer probably the same fate uh, if it was an inherent um, reliability problem. Uh, Paco, you wanted to add something else to that. Well, for, for the direction of reliability, now that uh, our, our automotive industry is, is becoming extremely well-connected as, as far as your, your mobile devices into your car, as well as your car basically uh, contacting the mothership and reporting its reliability over time, uh, there's a lot more to be considered. The, the electronics now going into automobiles is um, well, basically a, as, as part of working with collaboration with one of the, shall we say, small automotive suppliers is um, – I got the privilege of working with some really good reliability physics engineers on the semiconductor side. So when you consider that cars are now going to have an average of a hundred different um, electric control modules, each one of these electric control modules can have anywhere from 50 to a hundred parts in them. So now we're looking at, if we are approaching the industry of looking at a one uh, PPM failure limit, well at 0.5 PPM, on our failure, if we're looking at 100 modules with 100 or more parts in each module, and you start factorially building the calculation for what reliability is going to be, in the end, uh, from, from our automotive colleagues, we've been told that they're expecting one in 38 vehicles to come off the line and have some type of electrical issue that either needs to be troubleshoot or a troubleshot or the boards have to be replaced or something has to be validated or tested or troubleshot in that process. So when you think about it, 0.5 ppm it seems like it's really small, but when you compound it, com compound that by how many different components are there, it really starts making the reliability of we've got to push much more below 0.5 ppm. Yeah, it, statistics can be deceiving. I've had people say, yeah, we're 99.9% .9 uptime. I said, well, if an airline had a 99.9% .9 um, success rate, safety rate, there'd be 10 crashes a day, you know? So it is a, it is a, a, a very deceiving statistic. You well, know, if in my I car. That, mm -hmm. That's telling me, well, if I have a technology on a refrigerator, that's telling me, Hey, you know, your, uh, your milk's about to expire. If it fails in that communication, no one dies. Right. Well, in my car, you know, I have a, a 2018 model car, so it has all the electronic gadgets in it. And, you know, every once in a while, on the infotainment system, I have to just pull over, turn off the car, restart it because it just gets stuck. Not very often, but it, it's happened once or twice this year. Um, I also have other electronic assembly modules that will nudge my steering wheel to the left or to the right to keep me in the center of the lane or apply braking if it sees me getting too close to a car. Uh, you know, I can't afford to pull over and restart the car if all of a sudden my car is trying to make a U-turn. Uh, you know, when electronic assemblies now control the throttle, the braking, the steering, uh, it, it's it's a whole different game compared to just listening to XM radio uh, and 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 wanting to hear you know the Comedy Channel at four o'clock or whatever. It's it's uh, it's a little bit more life or death when it comes to fly by wire reliability. Is it is, it is for sure. Is there a uh, do you see a rise in reliability-based issues uh, or, or decline in general? And if you do see a rise or a decline, what's driving that? I don't know that it's 
a, a rise or a decline. You know, uh, you know, in terms of what we do around here, I think it's been you know fairly steady. Um, you know, we have such a cross section of of customer base from you know automotive, aerospace, you know, uh, some consumer electronics. You know, we pretty much every um, every segment of electronics industry. I, I don't know that it's really increased any, but I think it might be changing over with the you know the continued miniaturization. Um, looking at bottom terminated components specifically and things like that, um, I, I think it's just new challenges. I, I think we've moved away from you know some of the stuff we were working on ten years ago, and we just replaced that with you know bottom with you know QFNs instead of micro BGAs. Well, I'm very glad you brought that up because that was going to be one of my next questions. Is is, is there a, speaking of bottom terminated components? Is there a disconnect with component manufacturers and the users of such components? Because here, here's what seems to happen from my view. Uh, the latest package uh, format comes out, and then we have three or four years of conferences on how to how to use those packages. <laughs> and, and you know, I just got back from Chicago uh, a few weeks ago, where we had the cleaning and coding conference. And of course, I think about every other presentation, if not every presentation, mentioned bottom terminated components. You know, it's the devil, and and it and they've been out for a lot of years, and we're still talking about how to mount them, how to modify the board so we could use them with more reliability. Uh, I mean, is there some kind of disconnect between component manufacturers and assemblers? Well, they're not just a drop-in solution. If, say if I had a, um, you know, an, an SOT device and I'm going to throw in a bottom terminated component, it's not just here, put a redesign and drop it in there. Uh, there I mean, the design consideration needs to be part of this, part of the, the design for manufacturability. You just can't re have a, uh, board design guy relay it out for the new footprint and boom there you go I mean, there's there's more to be thought of but that's the way that most engineers have seen to approach it is it's a drop-in replacement and i can shrink everything around it yeah i'll get rid of i'll get rid of these components and substitute them for these components and then they find out that these components are they may be a functional substitute but they're not a but i don't believe that's on the component manufacturer necessarily i think uh, you know there have been some improvements um you know qfn specifically I remember when we first started looking at those, you know, on a regular basis, maybe a decade ago, um, or maybe not quite that long, but somewhere in that neighborhood. But, uh, you know, I would look at tech data sheets for these parts and, you know, they were all solid uh, pad termination or ground terminations on them. And since then, I've seen a change to a lot of the suppliers are making, you know, more of a window pane to open those things up, give them a little more standoff height, create an avenue to clean them out. And I've even seen some go as far as to say, you know, these parts should never be washed, basically. You know, no clean flux is the only acceptable um, way to solder these to the board, and they they recognize that there's that issue. Now, there's still a little shortcoming on recognizing the fact that, you know, no matter which flux type you use on a QFN, you know, you can fail it either way. They're not cleaning it out fully with the water soluble or not processing it properly if it's a no clean. But, you know, in the end, I don't think you, you know, you I don't think you blame the component manufacturer necessarily for having a disconnect with the with the assembly side of things because you know they don't own your process you know that's that's with all the different specs and, and industry guidelines out there i always say you know what these are in lieu of nothing these are great but at the same time you know you have to own your own process and know what effect that changing out to a qfn with a solid ground termination you have to know what effect that's going to have on your board and, you know, directly related to how you're processing that, if you're cleaning it or not. And uh, and, and doing the due diligence to be able to test it and, and know how to look at it with an analytical eye to say, OK, are we using this part properly? You know, functionally right now on the bench, it's working just fine. We've saved, you know, half a penny per board, which is great over a billion boards. But, you know, what's the reliability impact of this part? So, you know, I don't necessarily think there's a disconnect. I, I think the parts manufacturers, you know, give you the tools and how you use them is, you know, entirely up to you. And they have no idea how you're going to use it in your application. But uh, they give you their, their best guess and, and they give you all the information that to uh, hopefully design it in. Right. And on the subject of, of they don't know how you're going to use it, uh, when I was talking with Bob Willis on our first episode, of reliability matters. He made a comment, which I found interesting, and I think this can be applied to other areas as well. And that you know, there's an issue. People are all concerned about voiding uh, and on these uh, bottom terminated components. And when they talk to the actual the component manufacturers, you know, they'll say they're chasing voiding percentages that are unrealistic and unneeded. That that 
there's enough of a connection, even with a lot of voiding, there's a lot enough of a of a connection to carry the current and to dissipate the heat yeah. uh, at a at a lot more voiding than they're getting now. But people have this this mindset that they have to have X percent voiding or no more than X percent voiding and and they chase it, whether or not they really need it. And I think the same also goes in, in your world for residues. There are you know, it's like Wizard of Oz. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Are you a good residue or a, or at least not a harmful residue or are you a harmful residue? And, and um, you know, we, we see residues on a board that maybe a customer will find offensive and it's not touching an electrical component. It's not even on a trace. It's not on a pad. It's not on a via. It's just, you know, it's just there. And you know, arguably, unless you're going to coat the board and you're concerned about delamination or something else, it's not harmful. And there are some residues that can be trapped under components that are, uh, for example, no clean residues that if profiled properly are sealing in, kind of putting all the bad actors in jail in this resin dome um, that will prevent bad things from happening in some cases. Uh, it, and there are other cases where some of those unencapsulated bad actors are are there to wreak havoc on the board. So the fact that this residue may mean it's bad and we need to fix it, it may mean it's just there and it's no big deal. That's where I think companies like yours come in handy to to kind of differentiate the the good witches from the bad witches, so to speak. Yeah, that's absolutely true because visual inspection of a residue doesn't tell you anything other than I can see something, I can't see something. And just because you can't see a residue doesn't mean it's not there. So, you know, being, you know, proactive enough at the beginning of your assembly process to say, OK, let's take a look at this board with an analytical eye and not just our physical eye, you know, under a scope. Um, OK, is there something there is step one. Step two is, you know, what is it? So, I mean, you're never going to achieve zero residue. Um, but do you have acceptable levels of residue based on the, the material package that you've chosen? So you, you really nailed it there. I mean, if it's there, does it matter? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's and can, can you design your materials and your operating environment right. work with that level of residue, whichever, whatever level it is? So I talk a lot about um, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail in a few minutes um, there. It's really difficult when someone says, how clean does a board have to be, you know? I really can't answer that unless I ask them a series of questions like, okay, what's the cost of failure? Where is it going? Um, you know, what are the reliability expectations? Uh, how many bottom terminated components do you have? How close are things together? Blah, 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 blah. It is the Doug Paul's line. You know, it depends. <laughs> it it depends. depends. And it depends. We should actually put it depends in almost every IPC standard because it, it, exactly. Cause it's contextual. Right. So, um, well, one one thing I wanted to ask you before we move on is: Do we have a failure du jour? Is there a is there a failure of the day? Is there a? I notice in our business that um, issues come in themes. You know, this is a uh, X Y Z issue or another issue, and and we seem to have that for a month, and then we move on to an a entirely different issue, and then we get a bunch of commonality there. Is there a particular? Are your phones ringing off the hook with with a very similar problem uh, for a period of time? Well, parasitic seems to be something that's always active. That's a that's a continual time. theme. Parasitics. So, so that's on the menu all the time. Yes. Well, and that's does. frustrating. That's the frustrating one. That's the WTF one, right? That's the one where <laughs> it you can't always duplicate the problem. It only happens when it wants to happen. You know, more more to the the specific question that you're asking, though, Mike uh, du jour, You know, I've had I've talked to two customers just today about doing mixed flow gas testing. Um, you know, there seems to be more and more issues with people that are doing immersion silver plating and then going into a high sulfur atmosphere, causing creep corrosion and uh, that, that, that type of failure mode. And, and I think that is related to, um, you know, two different things. You know, we're seeing a lot more immersion silver uh, being done. And then the, um, the, the end use environment that they're going into having, you know, more and more sulfur every day, you know, and, and I think that's only going to increase going forward, you know, unless something is done about air quality in some of the, those parts of the world. Is that an issue also um, specifically with LEDs? Is there a, a similar creep corrosion kind of issues with some of the materials used in, in the fabrication of LED? Are you aware of that? Well, a lot of LED, high-end LEDs are still um, gold-backed. 
Uh-huh. So a lot of those will re- and require uh, more of either bare copper or a a uh, inig surface in order to make a ve- they're in order to make a very good contact with a very low thermal gradient. Uh, a lot of the high end uh, LEDs at this point don't tend to be on the silver side. Uh, a lot of them are still moving toward uh, T clad. Okay. Assemblies. My experience as a consumer of LED problem of LED lights, I have a I have a house with a it seems like there's a billion light bulbs in it. So I was on this kick several years ago to start every time I change a bulb, I change it to an LED bulb, thinking that's the last light bulb I'll change in my lifetime, at least at that location. And I'm amazed. They, 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 you know, they say they last 20 years and they're guaranteed, but of course, you know, a year and a half later, the receipt's gone and you can't take it back. And I find that uh, LEDs fail in in relatively um, you know, non hazardous environments, like inside a house. There, there, are, there are some issues there. Maybe that's a. I'll have to get an LED manufacturer on for one of these future podcasts and figure out why these these things just start flickering. Um, oh, anyway, that's another yeah. subject. <laughs> You've actually fallen off one of my passions. Uh, my house is almost 100% LED. And, yeah. uh, I found and do you experience the same thing? Very reliable. I've only had three bulbs go out in seven years. Only three bulbs. All right. Well, I'll have to. We'll talk offline. I'll figure out where you're buying your stuff. So All many right. years ago, foresight. I've you know I've known you guys for a lot of years, and and uh, I think this is an accurate statement. Foresight broke away from traditional IPC maximum contamination specifications, which you know were were obsolete. You know, a year after they were created, maybe even the day they were created. <laughs> <laughs> and and you kind of created your own criteria. Uh, so what was the basis for creating a very specific contamination uh, threshold? And what are the advantages of kind of going off, you know, off the reservation and 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 creating your own? Well, I, I think to you know answer the, the first part of that question or the, the address the first part of that, you know, it's there really wasn't or there never has been, um, you know, limits in the IPC for maximum contamination per I, uh, per ion chromatography testing. You know, there was the 8.2 drop in for, um, uh, rose testing, which, uh, you know, has historically been used. And I think when, you know, Terry opened up, uh, CSL back in the day, you know, the idea was to do something kind of next level because, uh, we wanted to look at each individual species, uh, that's what he had kind of uh, taken from Delco and, and determined that, you know, you really have to match the exact species of ionic content, be it from, you know, PC fab manufacturing, um, you know, component manufacturing, whatever it was. And that to get that detailed information, you know, obviously you have to do ion chromatography. Well, looking at, um, you know, the, our, our database, you know, before my time here, um, you know, the, the our limits were kind of uh, put together, pulled together based on what we see as an average for good product in the field. We would see failures, um, you know, back as far as I can remember, you know, when we look at a failure, we also like to look at a current production to kind of determine, okay, is this in the field? Is this systemic? You know, did it fail because of something you did? And and when you look at the boards that didn't fail in the field, look at their levels, that's really where our uh, limits for ion chromatography came from. And uh, I think that's been, you know, the, the 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 most helpful thing that we've been able to apply to to the vast majority of our customers to say okay look here is our recommended limits and and you know I always like to tell everyone you know they are just that they are also recommended limits I, I used to kind of I don't know if go against IPC or whatever the word I, I would use here is you know I would kind of blame them you know hey why don't you put some numbers down to these this ion chromatography test so you know we can uh, get that in writing and say, okay, you meet the IPC requirement because we were getting that question all the time. Are your limits an IPC specification? But in, in the same way, you know, I, I now kind of understand after a, a lot of years doing this is, you know, there is no one size fits all. So it's very hard to say that, you know, one set of limits for ion chromatography or really any type of cleanliness test, you know, is going to apply to everyone. And that's definitely, you know, been brought to light here in the last couple of years with the IPC Rhino team working on J-Standard 002 drop-in uh, replacement. But, you know, they are just that. They're recommended limits. Now, I mean, every independent lab that's like Foresight, you know, uh, for the most part, we all have our own limits. And, uh, we, you know, we've done some comparisons. Um, at some of these meetings, and we're all within the same ballpark, give or take a few micrograms per square inch. Um, but 
you know, I've always said, you know, our limits work for the vast majority of our customers. Now, obviously, there are some uh, applications that need a stricter limit, a stricter set of ion chromatography limits. So we can deal with those on an individual basis as necessary. But, you know, what we put out there is our uh, recommended limits. And I always like to you know, say, you know, these are recommended limits, not, you know, there's no hard and fast number that says, you know, if you're at, you know, 3.1 instead of 3.0, you will fail. Um, it will possibly, you know, increase your risk of electrical leakage or electrochemical migration, whatever it might be. But, you know, I think that is the reason that we kind of went away from anything that the IPC was doing because, you know, they weren't really, you know, going out on a limb at all, you know, um, in, in terms of calling cleanliness uh, limits, well, what should be adhered to. And, you know, and, and the, the more I do this, the more I understand that because each product is different. But I, I do believe that, you know, kind of going out, and, and determining our limits based on, you know, a, a pretty good set of ion chromatography data from uh, our customer's product that has failed and that has uh, passed, you know, I think that kind of, you know, gives us a good starting point. And, you know, and, and that's kind of the way I, I've always felt about, you know, all specifications, you know, in lieu of nothing, you know, start here and then tweak it as necessary. Sure. Well, back in the rose testing days, if we look at zero to 10 micrograms of sodium per square inch equivalent, um, you know, the original IPC guideline or the historically accepted standards were, you know, 9.9 .9 was clean and 10 was dirty. So, you know, to your point, a 0.5 could fail mm -hmm. down an oil well in Houston and a 300 might never fail in an electronic flea collar on a dog or on a, on a through hole assembly or, or something right. like that. So it, in, in it really is a relative... Yeah. yeah, it's a relative standard. Is it going to Arizona? Or is it going to to yeah. um, Maryland in August? So the 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 new standards, which Doug Paul's uh, Rhino team put together, is something we've been talking about for a long time, and it's nice to see it make its way into an IPC standard. And it really is the it depends. He he did a really good job at coming up with a, a whole specification that basically can be translated into two words. It depends. And it relies on objective um, evidence. So they're less concerned about the method of testing as long as whatever method you've come up with, either an established method like a rose test or on chromatography or SIR or a made up test. Um, they're really interested in hearing uh, in in the objective evidence for that particular assembly. And I'll give you an example. We have a customer many years ago that built um, and still builds uh, amplifiers and uh, stage equipment for professional um, musicians. And they had a problem as they as over the years they they moved from tubes to solid state, from through hole to surface mount, from cleaning to not cleaning, uh, they had a problem. And their problem was evidenced by the, the quality of the sound coming out of the speakers. There was something wrong with the sound. I don't know what that, I couldn't hear the difference either way, but they heard it. So they sent boards to us and we cleaned them. And then we offered to test them uh, in a rose tester. And they said, ah, we don't understand that stuff. That doesn't mean anything to us. We have our own test. Oh, what's your test? Well, they, you can imagine they got a bunch of musicians in a sound booth. They plugged in their guitars and they turned on the amps and they started jamming. And they listened to the, what I like to call now the sound of clean. They, they listened to how reliable their boards were and how well functioning their boards were by listening to the sound. So for them, I mean, that could be uh, a, a cleanliness testing standard under the new 002. Um, which allows for obtaining objective evidence. They just have to document it and prove it and 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 um, and test for it. But that that's perfect because that is board specific and application specific and uh, climactic environment specific. Uh, that works for them. Coming up with a predestined number um, will put them in the right ballpark, but it may not solve their problem. Well, when it comes down to any specification, you, you, you cannot hide behind a specification. As right. Eric was mentioning, you have to use it as a guideline. And then does it really meet the, the function that your assembly is going to have in the field? Does it, does, is it really appropriate, whatever data you're getting, is it appropriate to guarantee that it's going to work, work as, as you've designed it? Sure. It has to do with the relativity of, of residue tolerance each assembly 
design has. And it's not just the design, it's the design, it's the use, it's the voltage, it's, it's the, you know, cost of failure, it's all of that stuff. Let's talk about harsh environments for a second. Uh, clearly, harsh environments push people toward um, needing cleaner boards. If there is a span of zero to 10, 10 being dirty, zero being clean, the harsher the environment, the more towards zero one, one wants to go, regardless of whatever test method they're using. So um, do you guys find the term harsh environment more relative today? Uh, I mean, we used to define harsh environments as, as oil field work or um, space or aviation or, or anything like that. Um, do you find that, that harsh environments are a little bit more relative today? And do we have to pay closer attention to where an assembly is going to be used? Well, I, well, we do very much. I mean, if if I can can kind of state my age here, you know, back in Berkeley when we were playing around with TRS eighties, and <laughs> when you were, when you went into Radio Shack and you were starting to talk to the the guy behind the counter, of like, okay, well, where do I put this? And well, the, the recommendation came to put it, you know, in your house and in the same location and make sure it has plenty of cooling air, and you know, make sure you're not moving it from room to room to room, and and it wasn't something that. Uh, that was expected to happen from electronics back then. We didn't expect it to go into constant vibration and to, to high you know, under hood conditions and near exhaust manifold conditions. You know, we didn't expect to shake it around like, you know, like it was a, a maraca or paradise. So originally we were told, Hey, you know, don't put it in constant in these environments. Don't put it in shock. Don't put it into, into heat and water. And, and now the way electronics is being integrated into very every aspect of our lives we're putting electronics exactly where we were told 40 years ago never to do it we're putting them under the hood we're putting them by exhaust manifolds by right next to hot oiled transmissions and putting them in environments it's not iost it's not internet of some things it's internet of things right (laughs) we're putting stuff everywhere everywhere where we never thought it would go yeah yeah exactly and, and, you know, and kind of building on that, I, I really think one of the things that hasn't been, um, you know, hasn't had enough attention paid to it is, you know, with putting electronics and everything where it wasn't before, um, you know, harsh environments are kind of exposing themselves. You know, kind of as I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, when you were looking at, uh, you know, immersion silver boards in uh, parts of the world with high um, sulfur content in the air due to, you know, coal uh, burn off and things like that. You know, we're finding that, you know, this is now a harsh environment where, you know, as the air quality worsens around the world, um, what wasn't a harsh environment is becoming one when it, you know, in terms of how it affects the circuit board and metallization and moisture that's in the air and things like that. So, you know, I I think the definition of harsh environment will continue to change when you uh, when you consider the environmental impact. Yeah. Oh my God! Sure. You're harsh, this harsh environment. Oh no! Don't do that! Don't put it outside. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I would imagine mean? there's entire cities in Asia, you know, India or you know, Shenzhen or wherever that just by that definition alone would be considered a harsh environment. Yeah, oh, for heavy sure. sulfonated air. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We need little masks. If people walk around in those countries with masks on. We need, we need the equivalent for for boards. So, what keeps you guys up at night as people who who know what's going to go wrong? Anything that kind of keeps you guys up at night? Is it the failure that someday everyone will do things right? Or, or uh, do you have enough confidence that there'll still be no. enough failures? <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't keep me up. <laughs> no. <laughs> what keeps me up at night is I, I, if I'm going to a supplier that's got an issue, and then I realize that uh, I'm packing my suitcase and I'm going to strap myself to an 80-ton dumpster and then go fly there, and all my clients have actually been put on this plane with me, you know, in, in proxy – Everything I've done for the industry and everything that I'm looking at and trying to solve, I'm going to rely on that going to my client. And, and it's sobering. <laughs> yeah, it, it really can be, you know, and, and I think, you know, I don't know if it keeps me up at night, but I think the thing that, um, that, that we've really seen cause an impact on reliability was turnover at the top. Um, you get a lot of guys that have been doing this that really know their stuff. Um, they've been exposed to the assembly process for, you know, 30 years now when, you know, through attrition or they're retiring, whatever it might be, you know, these guys leave, they, they take that information with them. Now the tribal I, knowledge. Yeah. Again, we work at a failure analysis lab, so I shouldn't scream too loud, but you know, that, that's really what we see is, is, is that tribal knowledge being lost when the elders, you know, take out and, and they bring in the new people and, you know, we're, we have to reteach, you know, everything 
uh, to these guys, but that learning curve can be, you know, very long and frustrating depending on what they're building. You know, it can also have a, a big impact on really everyone's daily life, so to speak. So it can you know, be long, I think frustrating that, and just, expensive. <laughs> yeah. Just, just being able to retain um, some of that knowledge, you know, it, it is, is really bothersome because we see it, you know, I've not been here, you know, my whole life. I've been doing this for almost 19 years now. But, you know, and, and I know Paco can, can definitely relate to this. You know, we've been to contract manufacturers. We've been to the same place teaching the same stuff to three or four different you know, staff, so to speak, you know, we, we would teach something about wave solder and then come around three years later, they'd call us, come back and we do the exact same kind of uh, line audit and education, you know, to a whole new group of people. So it, it just you know, everything's lost when, uh, you know, trying to save money or like see, the, the, it's so incestuous in the electronics industry. A lot of times we see, you know, employee A went from, you know, CM one to two to three, you know, and then they take all that knowledge with them a lot of times. Man, we, we have situations to where the, the, the new engineers are coming in and, and they'll say, well, look, let's look at cost reduction and let's look at a mo more effective. What's the best corrosive, uh, anti-corrosive material we can put down as far as a metal? And then they jump to it and they say, well, wait a minute. You can't put that metal with that metal because you'll make a potato clock and dissolve your product. <laughs> but, but see, <laughs> that, that's that tribal knowledge of, of, of this doesn't go right. with this. And it's been proved many years, but the newer guys come in and don't have that experience and tribal knowledge to say, Hey, that's not a good idea. Let's look at something else. Well, my last guest was talking about how we were on the same subject about how the old wise sages have retired. And most companies don't want someone on their staff anymore that doesn't really do anything, but does everything, you know? So, so, uh, I think of like Doug Paul's and not that he doesn't do anything, but he does everything. I mean, he's, right. he's the cleaning guru of all of Rockwell, Dave Hillman with, 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 uh, metrology, uh, same thing, uh, an expert, a wide expert, wide process expert. And a lot of companies, when these guys, you know, retire in South Florida or, or Tahiti or wherever they're going, they're not replacing them. They're, they're the new kids, so to speak on the block. Um, look at numbers. They look at screens and, my last guest was saying they don't look at boards anymore. They no, look they at don't. they right. look at you know uh, uh, AOI data and and X ray images that are hypothesized. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're not really an actual image. They're just kind of built from a model. And, and everyone's becoming and six they, sigma black belts because uh, you know rejects are just scared of them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And 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 they're they're not really picking up and looking at the board. They're not pulling off components. They're not really looking at it. They're just looking at data. So one of the services that Foresight provides uh, is on-site process audits and optimization services. So what, what does that mean? What type of processes do you commonly audit? And what type of optimization do you provide? Well, sometimes it's not really an audit. Sometimes it's an investigation. Right? When we come into a facility, we, we have a whole bag of tricks. And strangely enough, we have the history of, of all the problems we've solved in the past coming in. So sometimes it's not so much an audit to a, a, a set of specifications, but it's a looking at their entire assembly process and coming in to say, well, we know that there's risk when this process is followed by this process if certain due diligence um, isn't followed or if certain procedures are, are done, they can easily introduce a contaminant here. And, and those are things that we've learned from other customers and now bring that as, as, as you know, that tribal knowledge back into this new customer. So um, I'll say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a, we got to change the, the name of this podcast to, uh, reliability it depends. depends. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and Paco's right. It, it really does depend on what the customer is needing us to come in for. I mean, there are definitely times when we come in, uh, you know, we are tasked to come into a, a contract manufacturer and look specifically at one part of the assembly process, nothing else. So and sometimes uh, we're told not to look anywhere else. Exactly. <laughs> But but for the most part, you know, the, the ones that, you know, I would say I enjoy the most are the ones where, you know, we come in and I, I like to call it a tip to tail where, you know, I'm looking at incoming uh, receiving storage, uh, what testing, if any, they're doing at that point, you know, how are they quarantining non-conforming product, you know, then they, they put it together in a, a kit to go to the floor. How is it being handled there? How are they storing the boards and the components on the floor before they're being used? You know, all the way through the, the process out to the, the final packaging, you know, put it in a box to ship out to the customer. 
um, because, you know, we have noted, you know, failures related to pretty much every step of that process from, you know, improper storage, uh, bad paste printing uh, procedure. It could be SMT. You know, a lot of times, you know, we're tearing apart a, uh, a rework bench, you know, because, you know, the company policy is to, you know, for instance, you know, never use any additional liquid flux. Well, you look at the bench and, you know, everything looks fine. But when you start digging around, you'll find a bottle of mother's little helper. You know, a lot of times, bottom, you know, the bottom I, drawer, <laughs> bottom drawer, exactly. You know, and when you start digging into things like that, you know, those are the investigations, I think, where we can do, you know, really the most uh, the most good in terms of, you know, reducing the amount of total um, you know, hazardous contamination left on a board after the assembly process. And because, you know, a lot of times when you're, you know, it, it's a can't see the forest for the tree situation. You know, you're looking at, you know, it's a very specific part of the process every day and uh, you, you don't take the entire process into consideration. So, you know, one process may not be causing a failure. You don't see anything there, but, you know, one plus one plus one plus one, you know, it's an addition and an additive process from you know, every individual step that that board goes through. And a lot of times the contract manufacturer doesn't think of it like that. You know, they're, they're hoping for one you know, smoking gun to be found on the floor or with one operator, whatever it might be, but we're more of the mindset. Okay. Let's just assess the entire thing. So, you know, sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's two days. Um, you know, we'll spend on the floor. And when we're looking at things like maintenance records, you know, we want to, uh, ideally, we don't want anyone to know we're there, but obviously that that's rarely the case. But, you know, you want to look back, you want to be able to sit back and, and watch how the operators are doing their day-to-day -day operation, you know, and then kind of adjust that uh, to, to what needs to be done. And, you know, it, it, you know, there's rarely any ill, you know, intent by the operators. They just, they don't know that what they're doing can, you know, cause a failure in the end. So, so I really like going on site and saying, okay, here's what we're seeing. You know, if you optimize these three things, you know, you're going to make much more reliable product. Yeah. You can remove these factors. You can remove these factors by removing this risk. Right. Many years ago, uh, you talk about watching a process. There's so much that can be seen just by watching, right? And, and learned by watching. Many years ago, my younger days, I, was, uh, I, was, I went to Florida because someone had one of our cleaning machines and one of our testers, rose testers, and suddenly everything went from really clean to really dirty. They started quote unquote failing every board. So we tried to troubleshoot it. It was just easier to go out there. So I flew to Florida and I, I, I said, okay, clean a load of boards. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not even going to look at the machine. I'm just going to watch the process. Let's just make sure the process is clean. So I watched the process, nothing wrong with the process. And then I said, okay, no, let's test a board. So then I found out that the person who normally performs those tests that, that, operates the machine was no longer there and the manager was doing all the testing whenever there's a change in staff it always is a red flag right For sure. <laughs> so so i i watched them and and it was a small board the test cell that held the test solution was about 18 inches tall the board was about five inches by seven inches so the board had to be lowered into the test solution normally that's normally they either drop the board in or they'll lower it down with a wire or something like that. So as he was getting the machine ready, the machine was indicating, you know, insert the, the sample. I saw him start rolling up his sleeves. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And he rolled his sleeves all the way past his elbow. And he grabbed the board with his fingers, sure. which that, that alone is a no-no. And then he, in, he slowly and gently lo lo uh, lowered the board all the way to the bottom with uh, his arm past in the test solution past his elbow, pulled his arm out, shook his arm off and started the test. And within 30 seconds, it failed. And, and then, of course, I'm like, OK, here's the problem. Now, how do I say this, you know, without yeah, nicely <laughs> sounding arrogant or, you know, here comes the bus. <laughs> you know, it's coming your way. Everyone move out. Uh, it's going to hit this guy. So, yeah, it's it's sometimes problems are, are, are self-created. It's just a real obvious easy fix once we watch it. But it's kind of like, you know, you mentioned, Paco, you mentioned earlier, sometimes customers tell you, look here, but don't look there. It's, and I'm going to make my second reference to the Wizard of Oz in this podcast. It's like, like paying no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, it's the man behind the curtain that's usually part of the problem. And, and uh, sometimes just a little tweak of process will fix everything. Sometimes it gets really deep, but not. so, you know, as we're, we're going to wind down because we're running out of time, but I do want to ask two, two more questions. And, and these are the fun ones. We'll have fun with this. So Paco and Eric, 
there's a circuit assembly that is uniquely responsible for keeping you alive. Some product you carry with you, not in you, but with you. And if that circuit assembly failed, if the product failed, you would die. So you are now responsible for how that board gets built. Would it be built with a lead alloy or a lead-free alloy? Or do you care? Lead-free. I'm sorry, leaded. Lead-free. Le- le- sorry, sorry, sorry. Leaded. Yes. Because yeah. we have okay. more history. All right. Me too. It would be leaded. Uh, I've got more more faith now in lead, lead-free materials and alloys, but uh, I'm still pretty much a leaded guy. Sure. Uh, cleaned or not cleaned? Cleaned. I, I don't care. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I I would say cleaned because I in, unless someone's watching how clean the board is and how clean the parts are and how clean the process is, uh, I kind of like that insurance that if someone's really Extra cleaning insurance. it at the end, they're they're uh, they're cleaning everything. And Eric, you're living life on the edge. You said you don't care. Well, and, and I always say that because you know I, I'm routinely asked the question, you know, would you recommend water soluble or no clean? And I say it does not matter because you can screw both of them up. But it's both of them. Uh-huh. It, Very true. If you uh, if you see a no clean residue, I, I believe there's a better chance that it will be inactive. If you see a water soluble residue, it will be active. But yes, if you're going to clean, totally. you better clean it properly. Partially cleaning a no clean <laughs> may be worse than leaving it alone. I, I'm leaving it alone. alone. <laughs> yeah, cleaning is not like horseshoes. It's not like horseshoes or hand grenades. It's not as close to the pin as you can get. It's all no. or nothing. You yeah, either clean correct. it well or don't clean it at all. Because right. cleaning it partially will probably result in a, a much higher chance of failure than Written not many cleaning papers it at all. When you, when you rip the Band-Aid off that wound, you, you've, you've just exposed it to the atmosphere. It's better just to leave the Band-Aid right. on. And if you're going to clean it, what kind of flux would you use to, for reflow? Water-soluble, Fine. rosin, no clean? Any, any preference? I think I lean more toward a water-soluble, water-soluble uh, uh, halide-free. If, I, if it's something I know mm-hmm. I'm going to clean... Right. And you assume you're going to clean it well. Uh, coated or not coated? Well, is it you're clean? You're carrying it around with you. Is it clean? Uh-huh. If, it's, if it's not clean, I don't want you to coat it and seal the freshness in. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm not going to coat because my, my product is a no clean flux residue, and I don't want to have adhesion issues uh, trapping air and expansion and things like that. Interested. Interesting. If, if you did coat it, what kind of coating material would you use? Acrylic, perylene, anything in between? I'd love to use Paraline. Yeah. Paraline. Paraline. <laughs> but then I'd have to And um, Well, there you go. Uh, any specific components to avoid? Would you, If you could have it built with any type of component you want, would it be all through hole, all surface mount? Would you avoid bottom terminated components or not? Uh, what, what would be your choice? That's a good question. I, I, I would um, avoid I, QFNs. I, I would avoid bottom, you know, QFNs specifically, bottom terminated components in general. Just because of the rash of issues we've seen, you know, over the last eight, ten years. And how would you <laughs> verify reliability before uh, using the product? Reliability testing. Lots of reliability testing, which is not done anymore. It, it's certainly not done enough. And, and, and when we're talking about reliability testing, you know, we're talking about the elevated heat and humidity testing on the actual product. Not material screening. Not, not for, yeah, not coupons. Not ECM mm-hmm. testing. Um, you know, I'm talking about... Your product, this product that's going to keep me alive, I want to put it under heat and humidity under, you know, operating bias for 500 to 1,000 hours or until failure uh, just to make sure that what we have done in the the assembly process, you know, is effective at at keeping that board working slash keeping me alive. There's not enough of that done in the industry, I think. Um, once again, you know, people rely on um, on specifications through IPC or whatever it might be, you know, to test. And a lot of that is done on test boards, not actual product. Not enough. Not enough testing is done on actual product. Too much is done on um, test coupons that are really meant to be material screening and uh, you know some process qualification. But you know, when the rubber meets the road, I, w- I want to look at your actual product. I mean, you can do test coupons all you want because that helps you along the path. But you, as Eric mentioned, you have to do it on your product. Right. That's the closest thing to a time machine that, that we can get to a crystal ball, right? Uh, this is what the product will look like five years from now in, a, in, a, in its own operating environment. I agree. Um, and that gets back to one of the quotes I said earlier in this podcast, which is we don't have time to do it right, but we'll certainly find the time to do it over. Okay. Last question. Without naming names, we don't want to get anyone angry. Uh, change some of the details if necessary. Protect the guilty. 
what is the best story from the field? I've, I've actually got a really good one. Great. So, Eric, I'll, I'll take this one. All right. Because I, cause I, I, I affectionately referred to this one as Aqua Velva for many years. Uh, back when I was uh, starting more in the reliability physics and, and uh, reliability test engineering position, that I was called out to a subcontractor, which was captive to our to our, uh, to our company being a small semiconductor manufacturer. So I got to go over and look at reasons why we were finding failures in our bias pressure pot, pressure pot testing. So we kind of kind of had the, uh, the heads up that it's only failing when we do the rel tests, but uh, if it's not the first shot rel test, then everything seemed to be passing fairly well. So they you know, throw me out to our, our in-house subcon. And the first thing I notice when I walk in the reliability lab is I smell this fragrance. And I, I can't place where it is, really, but I, I smell this nice fragrance and reminds me of kind of like aftershave. And, and as I keep going through the process and reading specifications and looking at the, the way they're basically injecting the, the, the plastic and in, injecting molding. And now I keep thinking that the first shot always fails, but everything after that's fine. I'll say, okay, well, well, what's going on here? And all the time I keep smelling this aftershave like fragrance going around. So now I start going through specifications and reading and I'm looking down to first thing you do with the mold is you clean it out and then you follow it out with isopropyl alcohol and a brush to clean it. So I'm going, well, that seems kind of funny, but, uh, and it doesn't really say what type of alcohol and what specification to use. And I'm so used to working in a lab where semiconductor grade or reagent grade alcohol is used. And all this time, the smell of uh, aftershave is in the background. So I, as I go through my audit of this process, I start looking and say, well, well, show me what alcohol you're using. And I'm, in fact, tripping over these little boxes with these green little bottles in them as we're moving through the reliability laboratory. And then uh, the, one of the engineers comes up and goes, here, here's our isopropyl alcohol. And I look at that, and it says, okay, 70% isopropyl alcohol, fragrance added. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. So you're, you're cleaning these molds with aqua velva, and then you're shooting the first shot and sending it to me for reliability and biopressure pot testing and pressure pot testing. <laughs> I'm going, I think I understand why everything's failing the first shot is – is you're contaminating your mold after you cleaned it, and now you're sending me the first product through that thinking it's a clean mold, and now it's failing in my, in my pressure pots every time. So I, I came to the conclusion that when you have a subcontractor, you can tell them to jump, but you have to remind them the specification to please make sure you land, or they're going to find a, a way to stay in the air indefinitely, and it's probably going to be the least cost and something that you really don't want. So you're going to have to put down and be very specific specific in your specifications that if you're going to do this, please use this quality and don't leave it up to the interpretation of your subcon to, uh, to do it the cheapest way possible. So if you're going to tell them to <laughs> jump, remind them to land and uh, watch out for the aqua velva. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I, this may have been, this may have been coming from you guys. I can't remember who this came from. I was involved in a civil, lit civil lit litigation matter a few years ago uh, about boards that failed in the field. And, and one of the reliability laboratories, one of the uh, analytical labs, I, it may have been you guys, uh, did some testing of the board. And they found, uh, we determined based on the testing that they didn't use deionized water during the final rinse. They used tap water. And the reason we knew that, we know that, is because they found that traces of fluoride on the board. Yep. Did that come? Is that familiar to you? Did that come from your lab? Or That's that happened a few times here. Okay. So fluoride, great for great for preventing cavities. If cavities were a reliability issue on circuit assemblies, we got that covered. But um, but they also you know left a lot of minerals, calcium, you know whatever uh, on the board. They had a lot of staining on the board uh, for that reason as well. So yeah, there's. It's funny what people will do to uh, avoid doing it right yeah, you have to be very specific when when especially when you're talking reliability don't use this but make sure right. you use this yeah it's, well you know kind of going on some of our favorite stories and i remember years and years ago um we were doing an investigation on cleanliness of uh, of some bare boards and the specification was to wash the boards after the plating and neutralization steps um this company was using water directly out of a river that ran near their plant because it was a, it was accessible, it was cheap, and it was you know plentiful, but it was one of the most polluted rivers in that country. But the specification didn't say not to do that. Right. So not only did they have 
uh, they not properly remove contamination, they have every factory upstreams contamination on their board. Correct. Absolutely. I guess, I guess that goes back to location, location, location. I guess if you're the, the head of the river, you're going to have the cleanest board. They're pretty clean board. Exactly. So either <laughs> either use deionized water or move up river. Those are the that's the takeaway from that. Hey guys, well, even if you say DI water, it's uh what do, what grade of DI water? Yeah. You can you can even break it down further. Right. Yeah. What's DI water? It's just not tap water. I mean, it's right. slightly yeah. above well, the still, all the way up to eighteen mega mega water. Or, <laughs> right. Yeah. Eighteen two mega, or do I need type two laboratory reagent grade DI water? Right. Well, Again, ask, it, depends. it depends. Ask and get. That's that's the that's the bottom line. Guys, thank you so much. We we've taken a lot of your time. Thank Terry for sharing you awesome folks with us. Um, Eric and Paco uh, from Foresight in Kokomo, Indiana. Uh, I've worked with them before. If you have, if you can't do it right, call these guys. They'll put you on the right track. There's a this is a non-commercial presentation, but I'm going to do a little commercial for you guys. I, I appreciate. I always enjoy talking to you guys. I'll see you. I, I guess I'll see you next in San Diego in yep, what, end of San January Diego. or something for Apex. And yep. anyone going out to Amsterdam for the Harsh Environment Conference? I'm hoping. I wish. Any takers? Okay. I'll see you there if you're there. And uh, thanks for spending so much time with me. I really appreciate it. This has been a great conversation. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to Reliability Matters. If you like what you hear, be sure and give us a like. Just click the like or heart button below. If there are any reliability-based questions you'd like to have answered or specific topics discussed, let me know. I can be reached at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes or follow us on Spotify. We'll be back soon with another episode of Reliability Matters. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters. 